Well, good morning. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started this morning with an update on the numbers. We had 113 new positive cases for a total of 1,710 positive cases. We had one new county, Cass County, for a total of 82 counties. We had 981 negative cases today for a total of 16,986 negative tests and a total of 18,696 tested. The State Hygienic Lab has 3,565 tests available. As of last evening, we have 142 hospitalized, 741 have recovered for a recovery rate of 43%. And I'm very sad to report that we have had two additional deaths, one elderly adult in Lynn County and one older adult in Muscatine for a total of 43 deaths. And our sincere condolences go out to the families of those who have passed. The number of Iowans who have successfully recovered from COVID-19 continues to increase daily. And later this week, we'll share information about what Iowa's epi curve is telling us uh, about our onset of illness. These signs are encouraging, but they certainly do not, they are not a reason enough for us to let up on our mitigation efforts at this time. As we've been saying, we project that Iowa's peak will occur later this month. And until then, we anticipate our, positive, our number of positive cases, and unfortunately, our deaths will continue to rise as well. Uh, Long-term care facilities also continue to be a big concern. Despite significant mitigation measures taken early on, including restricting visitors and screening staff at all shifts, the virus has still been introduced into some facilities, resulting in devastating consequences. Staff and residents of long-term care facilities account for more than 10% of all of our positive COVID cases in Iowa, and 53% of all deaths are residents of long-term care facilities. This is why it has been so important that we prioritize testing for essential workers and vulnerable Iowans. The Department of Public Health is working now to deploy the Abbott, the Abbott rapid testing machines to conduct surveillance testing among long-term care facilities, staff, and residents. When an essential worker tests positive for COVID-19, local public health officials are able to conduct contact tracing to determine any potential exposures that may have occurred and isolate those individuals as soon as possible to prevent further spread of the virus. And this is also why we continue to urge all Iowans to stay, as, stay at home as much as possible, work from home if you can, practice social distancing, seeing at any time you're in public, don't gather in groups of more than 10 people and isolate at home if you or any member of your household is sick. These important steps will significantly reduce the risk of further exposing, exposing our essential workers and vulnerable Iowans to the virus. All Iowans must continue to do our part to protect our health and the health of others during this critical time. I also want to provide a brief update on the Regional Medical um, Coordination Centers or the RMCCs after the weekend. So let's start with Regions 1 and 2 in Central Iowa. Yesterday in Region 1, which includes Polk County and the Des Moines Metro area, there were 38 COVID-19 patients hospitalized. Five new patients were, um, was admitted in the last 24 hours, 14 were in ICUs, and 11 were on ventilators. There were 1,365 inpatient beds available, 139 ICU beds, and 224 ventilators available for patient care. In Region 2, the north central area of the state, there, were, there was one COVID-19 patient hospitalized. No new patients were admitted in the last 24 hours. One is in an ICU and one was on a ventilator. There were 235 inpatient beds, six ICU beds and 25 ventilators available for patient care. On the western side of the state yesterday, Region 3 reported two COVID-19 patients hospitalized. One new patient was admitted in the last 24 hours. One is in an ICU and none were on ventilators. There are 540 inpatient beds, 44 ICU beds and 59 ventilators available for patient care. In Region 4, there were two COVID-19 patients hospitalized. One new patient was admitted in the last 24 hours. One was in an ICU and none were on ventilators. There were 254 inpatient beds, 37 
ICU beds, and 68 ventilators available for patient care. And finally, in eastern Iowa, as of yesterday, Region 5, where Johnson County and Scott County is located, we had 55 COVID-19 patients hospitalized. 12 new patients were admitted in the last 24 hours, 24 were in ICU, and 15 were on ventilators. And there were 727 inpatient beds, 85 ICU beds, and 166 ventilators available for patient care. And in Region 6, where um, Lynn County is located, there were 44 COVID-19 uh, patients hospitalized. Five new patients were admitted in the last 24 hours. 29 were in ICUs. 14 were on ventilators. And there were 1,225 inpatient beds, 69 ICU beds, and 133 ventilators available for patient care. Over the course of the last week, we spent quite a bit of time talking about the challenges of COVID-19 and what, how that presents um, challenges for the long-term care facilities. So in closing today, I wanna take a moment to recognize the staff who work in the over 444 long-term care facilities across Iowa, especially those who, who are working in facilities that have been impacted by an outbreak. You're more than caregivers. You're heroes on the front line of this, of this crisis. And I know this situation is especially difficult for you. So thank you for showing up every day with compassion and integrity and for caring for your residents as you would your own family. Please be safe and stay well and know that we will continue to do our part to protect you and to work with you. And with that, we will open it up for questions. Are there any updates on the... Um one to 10 scale for the various regions? Yep, there is. So um, in, we'll start with region six, it is an eight. RMCC region five is an eight. RMCC region two is a seven. RMCC region one is an eight. RMCC region three is a five. And RMCC Region 4 is a 6. And with some of those numbers declining, could you explain, like, Thanks for the question. I think you're specifically asking about um, Region 5. And so what's happened in Region 5 is we have, as we've continued to see case counts increase, the severity of the illness um, has also decreased. So the rate of hospitalization has gone down, which, so for that particular metric, um, that has gone from a three to a two uh, related to the hospitalization rate. So that's why you saw the decrease from a nine to an eight in that particular region today. Governor, can you talk about PPEs a little bit? Friday, there seemed to be a little difference in, the, in your tone, stressing the severity of PPEs as they stand now versus where we could go. Several hours after you talked, we heard from the president say that PPEs are not a concern. So for people who are glued to their TVs right now, following both of you, what is your advice on which person they're supposed to believe? And can you specifically talk about what you all are doing to get more of these PPEs? Is it through the feds? Are you doing them through private? Vendors, what's the process? Yeah, well, as I said over and over and over, it is an all of the above. So we continue to order through the National Lab. We continue to order through DAS. We continue to encourage our hospitals and clinicians to order through their private vendors. Uh, we have also spent a great deal of time working out, to, reaching out to incredible businesses and individuals across the state that have really stepped up. The Department of Corrections is just the number of gowns that they've been able to make and to get to our long-term care facilities, especially their washable gowns, which is so important because the burn rate on the disposable gowns is so high in these long-term care facilities. And so to be able to provide them with 
surgical, I mean, they're good gowns, um, but they're washable so we can reuse them is really uh, important. And so, you know, from the very beginning, we have all said that the PPE has been one of the biggest concerns. And as we have our heroes on the front line that are working day in and day out to protect Iowans and especially our most vulnerable, we have an obligation to make sure that we're providing them sufficient PPE. And so the stockpiles just weren't where they needed to be. And, and every opportunity that we have um, on a, a call with the vice president or the president or the task force, it's not always, I mean, we have individual governors that step up and talk about their need, but we also, through the National Governors Association, the chair is Larry Hogan from Maryland. And I can't think of a call that I've been on that he hasn't indicated, you know, and stressed that we all working together, we know we need to dig down deep within our collective states, but we also need to just continue to work together and raise the awareness uh, of the need for PPE. And so uh, we're going to continue. Uh, they've been very uh, responsive. When we had an outbreak and I needed additional Abbott uh, testing machines, I called Administrator Gaynor. He actually, you know, got, I set up a call. He got on the call with me. I walked through what the need was. We needed some rapid testing. We were able to get additional swaps, machines, and additional tests. And that's really going to be at the same time I was talking about that. I talked about the number of long-term care facilities that we have in Iowa. And to be able to deploy these Abbott machines, we, once we get people trained with um, the testing supplies, that'll really help us kind of, um, you know, get in front of it and start to um, you know, scope the exposure and help identify who's been exposed to get them home and really stop the spread. So, you know, we continue to reach out and let them know. And it's just, I think sometimes, again, we get hung up on semantics, but, but uh, you know, We've made them aware that we need, and every time that I've reached out, um, I have had really good, I have a really good response. All right. Um, to ask about the predicted peak, um, on April 7, according to AP, like that's when the um, state signed a contract with the University of Iowa. Can you help us understand how, like, what, what models are being used now for this peak and like what that underlying information is? So these are conversations that have been ongoing for quite some time. So it was the IHME, which is the model that came out from Washington, and I think all of us would concur that there's been tremendous swings even within that model. So it is just a model based on various assumptions. I mean, we went from 128 potential deaths to 1,500 to 430 to 700. Uh, we said at the beginning that it didn't take in, into account a lot of the mitigation efforts that we've actually implemented in the state of Iowa. Um, you know, we've We've been targeted and we've done it on a case by case basis based on data, and a lot of that wasn't taken into account. So, the Iowa Department of Public Health, and Sarah, I'll let you step in here too, uh, quite some time ago reached out to the University of Iowa, who have been great partners through all of this, to talk about how we can maybe take into account some of the mitigation efforts that we put in place and fold those into the modeling that was being done uh, with IHME. Um, but we, we, no, again, I just want to reiterate, it's a model, you know, and it's based on assumptions. And it's, as we've seen, I think, throughout this entire process, the modeling has been <laughs> wildly, uh, you know, off. And so we need to continue to do bottom line what Sarah and I say every day at this podium, and that is to take responsibility, practice individual responsibilities by staying home when you can, work from home when you can, you know, practice social distancing, limiting your trips to just essential services, uh, essential trips, and um, uh, really doing everything that we can to protect our most vulnerable and prevent overwhelming our health care system and uh, our, our health care workers. And so if we just continue to do that, we're going to see, uh, as they've said, I think the results that we're looking for. And most importantly, then we can stand at this podium and have a different conversation about how we start opening up this state instead of how we continue to close it down. Can we have, um, this might be for Sarah, Yeah. but can you walk, because the governor is now I think today may have been the first time you've given us a true percentage for recovery rate. Um, Sarah, could you maybe take us through maybe a hypothetical person, sort of oh. start to finish how you determine when a person is recovered and what factors or metrics or follow-ups or whatever go into that? Yeah, 
I'm gonna let Sarah do that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. No. So I would be, be happy to do that. So um, every time we have a positive case, uh, local public health agencies, um, who, by the way, in addition to staff at long-term care facilities, our local public health agencies are doing just an incredible amount of work, and they're doing an incredible job to follow up on all of these positive cases when they do receive them. So local public health agencies will get an alert um, through our data collection system that lets them know that there's a positive case result for uh, for a resident of their county. Um, and then local public health goes to work immediately and they follow up with the individual. They ask about um, close household contacts. They ask about, you know, kind of work environment. You know, I, as you've heard me say, we do have concerns about the number of healthcare um, professionals that are um, turning up as positive cases in our state. And so certainly any exposures that as a healthcare uh, that would have been um, identified in a healthcare setting or a work setting, um, the local public health agencies ask the, all of those sorts of questions, and then they would reach out um, either to the business, to the healthcare facility, those sorts of um, places, uh, high risk areas, to let them know that there was a potential exposure to a po uh, po COVID positive patient. Um, from there, then, local public health continues to follow up with those patients. Um, and so they'll continue to touch, re touch at, reach out, um, ask about symptoms. And somebody is considered recovered um, at least seven days after the onset of their symptoms. And then once they have been symptom-free, including fever-free, for at least a period of 72 hours or three days. And so once a positive um, case meets the, both of those metrics, then they would be considered recovered in the data that we're reporting. We're going to go to the phones. Um, Rachel at We Are Iowa, go ahead. Hi, Governor. Um, I have a few questions that are from viewers. Um, one, do we know where a lot of these new cases are being contracted? Is it mostly happening through familial relations, nursing homes, or are we starting to see community spread at places like grocery stores? And then we've also been getting some questions about why negative tests are being reported. So could you explain that and talk about if there are any false negatives likely to be happening? Well, we've been in substantial spreads for quite some time. So to Sarah's point, you should just assume that it's in your community no matter where you live because we crossed that level a long, long time ago. And that's actually some of the reasons that we took the steps that we did because we had moved from um, community spread into substantial spread statewide. Um, Sarah, do you want to answer that? So I would just add that, you know, we continue to learn more about this virus all of the time. One thing we do know is that it passes um, quickly and easily among members of households, people who are who live closely together. So in addition to, you know, household contacts also within congregate living sites like long-term care facilities. And so those are the areas that we continue to be concerned about. Um, but as the governor mentioned, we do presume that we have substantial community spread in all of our communities in Iowa, which why is it so important to stay home as much as you can, leave only for essentials. If you do have to go to the grocery store, send one member of the family, don't take the entire family, because if one person picks it up and you all live at home together, it's highly likely that there will be a transmission um, within the household unit. So. Um, I think that um, we all need to presume that it's present everywhere we go. Yeah. Um, Rod, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Governor. Um, you indicated last week you're putting together an economic recovery task force, which I assume will be looking at a possible phased in reopening of the Iowa economy. Yeah. Does it look like that process will begin on the west side of Iowa and eventually move east to the hot spot areas? And, Will you need a reliable system of antibody testing to make that happen? And if so, is such a system being developed and how prepared do you think the state is to make that transition yeah. to reopening the economy? Yeah, well, that's some of the uh, questions and uh, things that we'll walk through with the Economic Recovery Task Force. So we're gonna originally bring just a group of my department heads together um, this week to start to identify what some of those questions look like, what some of those metrics look like, and then we'll broaden the scope out to bring some of the private sector on board to walk through um, the economic recovery. So it almost, Rod, all of the above will be things that we'll be considering, and every day they're making progress. You know, hopefully we continue to do more testing. Our goal is 
is to continue to do even more testing, to be able to do the contact tracing, to be able to really figure out where those hot spots are and really um, focus in on what we can do to help mitigate the um, the, the spread in those areas. And so, um, you know, I would said, I've said all along that we potentially will be able to open up in different areas. But, you know, it's too early right now. As I said at the beginning of my remarks, why we feel good about the direction that we're heading, we're still not at the peak, and that's not anticipated until the end of the month. We will get through this. We will recover. I want to open up this state, you know, as soon as we can, but I want to do it in a responsible manner. We don't want to open it up. Up just to have to shut things back down again. So we have to be very consistent uh, and again be relying on some data before we're able to do that. So we're looking at what all of those metrics look like. We're looking at what's available um, to, to be able to stand up some of the testing, some of the contact tracing, the being able to test for antibodies. They're moving forward with that. There's a lot of talk about that right now. So every day and every week we learn more and um, so, so we'll continue. But you know, we're going to do we're going to do a dual path at the same time we're really monitoring and working on mitigation efforts that we put in place throughout the state by Iowans doing the right thing and being responsible and staying home we're also going to start to look at what it looks like to begin to open back up because when we start to hit those metrics we want to be able to go but we want to be able to do it in a responsible manner Caroline Cummings go ahead Hi, Governor. Um, I want to go back to the um, contract first reported by the AP about um, Iowa's own model. Uh, the contract says that the model is intended for internal use only and that UI would not be allowed to release any information without Dr. Padati or the uh, state uh, medical director's approval. So I'm wondering what can the public reasonably expect to learn and see about any state modeling and or, or are you intending to keep all of that information uh, private? Well, Caroline, I think you know the answer to that question. We've been very transparent throughout this entire process, and we know that it's important to keep Iowans informed and up to date on what we're doing and what we're basing um, our decisions on. And so uh, we'll work through that. We will release it at some point. Um, but, you know, we're every day, again, I want to go back to this is a, a model, and models are only as good as the assumptions that we feed into them. It didn't take into account a lot of the mitigation efforts that we had put in place. The University of Iowa has been a phenomenal partner throughout all of this. Uh, we look forward to taking a look at what some of those recommendations are, as well as all of the other things that I just uh, listed when I was answering Rod's question about additional things that we'll look at as we move through um, this, this process. But uh, I appreciate their partnership. I appreciate them working with us. And again, it's a model, and I don't think anybody should ever lose sight of that. You're going to be, we're going to have some new information. I'm going to tease it out a little bit here for Iowans tomorrow. Uh, with a new website. So Sarah and I will be back tomorrow talking about that, which will provide Iowans with some additional information as well. So we are always looking for ways that we can um, provide Iowans with the information that they expect. Thank you for that question. Todd with KCCI, go ahead. Good morning, Governor. You had mentioned last week that we'd be getting close maybe this week to talk about schools going back. Yeah. Uh, have you got a timetable on that? Yeah, I told be this week, do you think? Yeah, excuse me, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Again, thank you for that question. There's asking about schools and when they can potentially open up. I had told them that in fairness to them, I would try to give them a two-week notice, which would actually be at the end of this week. And so we'll be watching the data and sitting down with the team, the Department of Public Health, and taking a look at what that looks like moving forward. But in fairness, so that they can make decisions, I'd like to be able to give them some indication by the end of um, this week. We're going to go to Aaron at Lee News. Thank you, Governor. I, I uh, just was wondering the uh, Public Health Department's guidance uh, to businesses um, uh, to self-report outbreaks says that the, the business names will not be shared publicly. I'm, I'm just wondering why that um, information would not uh, be public so Iowans can know where these outbreaks are happening. It will be public, right? 
Um, thank you for that question. I mean, uh, so our medical director makes determinations about, and, and we do this all the time for all sorts of disease outbreak investigations. At the point in time where we think that it becomes necessary to protect the public's health, um, that is the trigger for us to name um, a particular business or a particular entity. And so we'll continue to look at that as we move forward. Um, you know, at this particular point in time, we haven't had any businesses that have reported to us where we feel like to protect the public's health, um, that we need to name those businesses publicly. But in the event that we get there, um, we certainly will do that. Um, Clark Hoffman, Capital Dispatch. Uh, thank you, Governor. Well, I'm wondering, uh, going off of that last question, if you can at least uh, confirm how many cases work for grocery stores or food suppliers without naming the individual businesses. And then separately, um, I don't, it, it, can you talk about the steps Iowa has taken to limit the use of temporary or agency employees in long-term care facilities? Because some of these workers under normal circumstances might work in two or three care right. facilities a week. Right. Do you want to talk about that, Sarah, what you're doing to work with long-term care? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I'll start with the long-term care question. Um, that is one of the things that we talk to long-term care facilities about when they have identified cases, um, is that we want we really want to make sure that to the extent possible that employees are not moving between um, similar settings uh, when they're taking care of patients. We certainly want to prevent the spread of, of, of the virus within long-term care facilities. It's been a priority of ours for weeks. It continues to be a priority, and so um, we continue to ask those questions of facilities and we have daily phone calls um, with facilities where outbreaks have been identified and those are the some of the things that we are tracking I was just looking to see if I had um, Clark the answer to your first question about the number of people that work in grocery stores or the percent of all positive cases that work in grocery stores I don't I have a three percent statistic for um, food service but other than that I don't have a specific related to grocery stores or other sorts of um, establishments. Thank you. Um, two questions left. Second to last question. Katarina, Iowa Public Radio. Hi, Governor. Um, we've seen some outbreaks at um, food processing plants in Iowa, and I'm wondering if the state is working with those facilities, um, especially the ones in um, Columbus Junction and in Tama County, and then um, before the state had discussed um, sending those rapid testing machines to potentially to some of these places. Has that happened yet or is that still being discussed? Can we get an update on that? Yeah, yep. Yeah. So they are working closely with both facilities. Dr. Badati and her team has been in contact uh, with them early on. We have um, deployed the Abbott machines down to um, one of the facilities. In addition to that, they were able to uh, send additional swabs to the to work with the local public health and their, the um, facilities public health team to administer those so that we could start to get some sense of, again, uh, who was testing positive and negative and to start to do the contact tracing to start to um, figure, understand the scope of the exposure. So again, I was grateful that we were able to get the additional machines, not only for those two facilities, but for the long-term care facilities as well. And there's some additional test training that needs to be done with the Abbott machines. And so we're hoping that that will take place this week. Uh, last question, Ryan Foley, Associated Press. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, it, if the assumptions in some of the national models have been uh, mistaken or off, can someone explain why it took until April 7th for the state to finalize this agreement to create uh, an Iowa-specific model? And has the state shared its data set with the university so that work can now get started? Well, I don't think you should assume that no, no conversations or no dialogue happened prior to the contract being uh, signed. That is not accurate. So we have been, the, as I've said three times, uh, the University of Iowa has been a great partner throughout this whole process, and we appreciate them being a resource and the expertise that they're providing, as well as um, Iowa State and many, just many um, facilities across the state have been very helpful. So um, I assume we've provided the data for them, but Sarah, do you want to add to that? 
Um, yeah, so Ryan, we are just um, getting ready to provide data. One of the things about modeling is you need a sufficient um, baseline of data so that uh, any model can be actually informative of what you're trying to do. And so I appreciate your question. Um, to the governor's point, we have been talking to the University of Iowa uh, in the weeks prior to when that contract was signed. We're getting ready to finalize the data provision to them, uh, but we really wanted to make sure that we had enough data so that any modeling that they did would actually be meaningful based on what's actually happening here in Iowa. And all along, the mitigation measures that we have been recommending to Governor Reynolds, that has been based on what is actually happening here in Iowa. So do we have community spread? Do we have evidence of that? And as we see those things happen, those that, that's what we're basing our recommendations on. Um, because as the governor has explained, models you know, can be helpful, but they're not going to necessarily be prescriptive in terms of the actions that we take. And so we're going to continue to look at modeling and look at forecasting because we understand that we're going to be in this for a while. Um, but it, every recommendation that we've been making has been based on what is actually happening here in Iowa, the mitigation efforts that have been taken. Um, and so we just really appreciate Iowans um, taking those mitigation measures to heart. And we just need to really keep it up. And I know it's difficult and I know it's hard, but those are the things that we can all be doing right now to protect the health of our families and our communities. Thank you. And I just want to reiterate, Sarah said it earlier, but to those local public health officials that are also on the front lines, thank you for the work that you're doing each and every day in communities all across our state. Uh, we appreciate it so much and uh, just hang in there and keep up the great work. Thank you.